kicking off the list at number 10, William Thomas Stead. Born in 1849, William Thomas Stead was the son of Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of the Northern Echo, a regional newspaper in Darlington. This British medium, Richard Borsonall, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a spirit. Or a demon. One of the two, both pretty terrifying. While William was investigating a spiritual case, he took this photo with what's supposed to be the spirit of Pete Botha. Now, the reason many believe that maybe the spirit is evil is that Stead later on died in the Titanic. He boarded the ship to take part in a peace congress at Carnegie Hall, and survivors mentioned William Thomas Stead a few times. Apparently, at dinner, he was chatting his way throughout the entire 11 course meal, recounting exciting, spooky times in his life, even mentioning a cursed mummy that he encountered at the British Museum once. That's a little odd for table talk. He even gave his life jacket to another passenger that night too. Stead would often claim that he would one day pass due to hanging or to drowning. And right before he was to be awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize, he passed away due to the latter. Was he cursed? I believe so, to be honest with you. What do you guys think? Number nine, the demonic boy photograph. It doesn't matter where or when, but odds are you've probably seen this photo at some point. All those late nights when you're scrolling through Reddit, you've probably seen this at some point. I know I have, and every time I see it, I'm kinda like, mm, it looks pretty real, it's pretty haunting. You know when you see a photo, sometimes you get bad vibes, like it registers in your brain as something scary and real. Like you wanna find something that looks fake about the photo, but it's tough. This photo was taken inside the Amityville house in 1976. It appears to be a young boy or ghost, spirit, demon, whatever, with glowing white eyes. It was taken with automatic cameras equipped with infrared. And it makes it even creepier that the boy looks like he's peeking around the corner. Like he knew something was coming almost, he didn't want to get caught. That's the creepiest part here. A photographer named Gene Campbell took it, and Gene was working with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren at the time. Yeah, the famous duo now rocking the big screen Conjuring universe. This was a real thing. They were on this case in real life. This photo was revealed three years after it was taken, and it was revealed on the Merv Griffin show. Imagine seeing this on a show, like Jimmy Kimmel whips this out. It's like, hey, we're gonna play Plinko. Check out this demon. Many believe this is the ghost of John DeFeo, one of the boys who lived there prior during the 1974 event. Now we're still trying to cover this one, but what do you guys think? Is this an elaborate hoax? Is this a young boy? Or is this one of the many demons that was said to haunt the house? Sound off down below. Number eight, the SS Watertown. This picture here perhaps is one of the creepiest on this list. I'm not sure what to think of this one. It comes from 1924 and it shows what appears to be two older men or two older figures almost. I don't know, it's water, it's hard to tell. Some believe it's James Courtney and Michael Meehan in the water. Now the two had previously died and were buried at sea, hence that's why their first thought was them as to who it was. Other crew members saw these strange faces in the water as well. So when they turned back to get another look, five out of the six photos showed nothing. This was the only photo that showed what they saw. Are these the two lost crewmen or is the vessel haunted by sinister forces? Number seven, backseat driver. This photo is from 1959. Okay, it was taken by a lady named Mabel Chinnery. And the photo at first glance is just a classic 60s shot of a man in a car. That man was Mabel's husband. Now the man in the back seat, however, that back left seat, we have no idea who that was. Her husband apparently was the only guy in the car at the time. And also, that's a pretty tough angle. If you wanted to recreate this photo with your friends after work, like try this. This is a really hard shot, even with phones now. It would be hard back in the day. It's like he's appearing to us through the seat almost with that angle. So either this is a lie, which happens often, people can lie, and a man was sitting in the back left seat, or like Mabel thinks, maybe this is her dead mother-in-law. Now, if she had said father-in-law, I think maybe it was his spirit, but this for sure looks like an older gentleman with a collar or something. Kinda looks like, uh, dare I say it, the devil. I don't know, I read a lot of comic books. Number six, Coventry Society Demon. You may be thinking, some of these may not be demons, Taylor. Maybe they're just nice spirits who stuck around after they passed. Yeah, while it's nice to believe that, photos like this convince me otherwise. This is from the Coventry Freeman Society and it shows everybody at this event dressed to the nines. But when you look at the top left corner over here, you see a hooded figure. Somebody that clearly doesn't belong with the vibe in this room at this event. Nobody else was seen also at any point at that night wearing a hood like this. So of course many believe it was a dark part of the afterlife photobombing this event. Honestly, I totally believe that. This is a weird one. The hood, it's... I, maybe I've been watching Harry Potter lately, I don't know. Maybe it's a Dementor, we actually don't know. 
Number five, a bunny's tail. Back in 1963, the Playboy Club in New York was one of Hugh Hefner's greatest accomplishments at the time. The club was, of course, the talk of the town until Gloria Steinem came in. Gloria was a feminist writer. She created Miss Magazine back in 1972. She's a very big lady. I don't know what I was about to say. She's a big deal, but her career began much earlier around the 60s. See, she got a job as one of these Playboy bunnies and worked at the club undercover. How badass is that? She was secretly taking note of how this key holders only establishment was was operating. And it was pretty sketchy. I mean, use your imagination. It was horrible towards women. They're wearing high heels while running drinks. The staff were these young, young women, the bunnies, they had to wear these black bodysuits, the puffy white tails, the whole getup. And at age 28, Gloria worked undercover there for three weeks. The piece she released after, appropriately titled A Bunny's Tail, got so much attention that it kickstarted her freelance career. It made her a feminist icon. This photo of Gloria undercover shows you the comfortable work outfits she had to wear. I sure hope she had her non-slips on. It's a really dark establishment too. Say corner a lot. In a collection of her writings, Gloria reflects on the undercover piece, saying, my expose of working in a Playboy club has outlived all the Playboy clubs, both here and abroad. That was before Hefner passed away in 2017. She didn't mean to, you know, take a jab at him, but she also did outlive Hugh Hefner. I'll say it. She doesn't have to take the smoke on this style. I connected the dots for you. In our number four spot today, we have Cher. Cher is often referred to as the goddess of pop, and for good reason. She is an absolute legend and an icon. She has never been afraid to push the limits or go outside of the box. So when we came across this photo, we were both surprised and not so surprised at the same time. This little photo comes to us from 1959 when Cher was just 13 years old. As it turns out, Cher was driving when she wasn't supposed to. In a 2013 appearance on The Tonight Show, she explained that a friend of hers had asked her to watch his car while he ran inside to do something. Cher moved the car a couple of times to get out of the way of other people, but then decided that he was simply just taking too long and decided to drive herself over to the drive-in theater. Luckily, everyone was okay, and once the police brought her to the station, they simply just called her mom to come and pick her up. Apparently, she didn't even know she was being arrested at the time, which I totally think you can tell by her expression in the mugshot. Number three, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. Of course, we all remember this one. At one point, we heard about it, be it on LimeWire in the middle of your song, this would randomly play. Bill Clinton talking about not having sexual relations with that woman. Back when we had to download music, that was a classic. So loud, so out of nowhere, and so loud. But this was a huge presidential scandal. Scandal, you know, back when they weren't every other week. It was 1998, Clinton White House intern Monica Lewinsky was 22 years old and they had a sexual relationship from 1995 to 1997. They definitely did. But Lewinsky said she hooked up with Bill nine different times at the White House. Apparently, according to your schedule, Hillary Clinton was at the White House for at least seven of those visits. But if I see this photo, I wish I was alive to see this unfold in real time. I mean, I was alive, but I was three. You know what I mean? I wasn't like, Damn, that's crazy. In our number two spot today, we have an A-12 spy plane. This photo is one that shows the remnants of a crashed A-12 spy plane from 1963, as well as the subsequent cleanup and rescue mission. This crash happened during a test flight when pilot Ken Collins was testing the plane's subsonic engines at a low altitude. Ken was then flying under his Area 51 code name, which was Ken Colmar, which is just the coolest thing. I really want a secret agent code name. Anyway, at 25,000 feet, the plane basically inverted and somehow landed its upside down. So now Ken is flying upside down and he knew he wasn't going to be able to recover so he ejected himself. In the end Ken was okay but the same obviously couldn't be said for the plane. To make this cool story even cooler apparently US officials later made Ken undergo hypnosis and treatments of sodium pentothal which is thought to be like a truth serum in order to be sure he relayed the details of the incident as fully and as truthfully as possible. That's serious business. Usually I just ask someone a couple times and then go with whatever they tell me. And finally, number one, Charlie Chaplin and Co. I'm wearing a hat now and a sweater. I'll never tell you why. When we think of Chaplin, we often think of the mustache, the physical comedy, the hat, the fact that he lost a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest, yada, 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 we know the rest. We remember the performances that he would give us for the most part. It's how you want to be remembered as an artist, ideally. Now when it comes to Chaplin though, those old timey photos of the comedic genius also include his number of different wives, a lot of them being much, much younger. The first two being years old when they were married, right? His first marriage was with Mildred Harris in 1918. He was 29, she was 15. Odd, that marriage only lasted two years, and then he married Lita Gray in 1924. She was also 16. Odd again, that marriage ended with a messy 50-page divorce where it was revealed Chaplin was pretty in all of his manners as a husband. Still the biggest film star, regardless of how he treated co-stars and also ex-wives, he went on to marry Paulette Goddard nine years later, who was 22. A bit better, but here's the crappy part. She said she was 15 when they met, so a year older than his ex-wives. And he was still pursuing her after she said that, so 
Odd again. He moved into her mansion shortly after they began talking. Seven years later, that relationship ended too, and thus began his new relationship with Una O'Neill. Chaplin in his 50s, and Una at age 18. He was the same age as her father. Makes the mustache a little less fun now, doesn't it? They both remained together until Chaplin's passing in 1977. We're talking about Pete Davidson, when really we should be talking about Charlie Chaplin. Number five. The ghost pilot. Oh, this one gives me the creeps. I'm hoping it's just a friendly ghost. I included it because it's kind of nice, but you never really know, honestly. This one, I did some research. It's creepy. Any sort of spirit I don't welcome. Yeah, I don't gamble on the afterlife. I'm actually all set. The ghost pilot is a photograph that shows a spirit from 1987. A woman named Mrs. Sayer was visiting an airfield in England, so of course, she did the classic tourist thing and got a photo in the cockpit. We all do it at some point, but do you ever think of who may have died in that exact spot before? After the age of 10 years old, I was like, you know what? I understand ghosts. I'm not going to sit in that tank. I'm good. Thanks. People swear the Titanic was a cursed ship and that spirits were responsible for the ship's bad luck. Now, next time you want to sit in the pilot seat, look around for spirits because this image was developed and it appears that somebody or something was in the helicopter with Miss Sayer the whole time. Number four, the Paris demon. Originally, the tunnels under Paris were built for stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, it turned into something haunting. Cemeteries were starting to fill up, and I mean that in a literal sense, and humans didn't figure out how to be clean, so bodies would just be laying on the sides of the roads. They started to pile up over time, so the solution was to use these catacombs. They were no longer needed for those mines anymore, so might as well use them as a mass graveyard. And now we have the scariest basement in the world. We have walls of skulls that on one hand, it's cool as hell, it's natural history, it's gothic, yet beautiful, but when Google Maps tried to give a user an up-close look, it seemed to have caught a shadowy demon figure. With more than 6 million souls laying down there, it doesn't shock me to hear about something like this at all. There's a video of the street view and in it you can see this figure. Check it out yourself. Number 3. Demons Are Us. For this next one, we'll be going down the Lego aisle. Yeah, how fun. A haunted Toys R Us. Can you imagine all those toys starting up at night by themselves? Boom. Bay Area's haunted Toys R Us is no longer a thing. Thankfully, as of 2018, that location closed down, but its tales, they live on forever. The Sunnyvale Toys R Us demonic presence appeared in the background of this photo. But of course, like others on this list, the people present at the time of the photo swear that nobody else was there. It's like everyone has bad memory, everyone has good memory, I can't really tell right now. It's like, mm, could this be a spirit or a demon caught on tape that just happens to be at a Toys R Us? I vote yes. Employees talked about creepy things happening there at night all the time, and the Sunnyvale store is indeed haunted by more than one ghost. That's what people say. The store stood where the Murphy farm once stood, so many think the spirit is the ghost of Johnny Johnson. I don't know, the fact that Ouija boards are a toy, a toy that is commonly used to, I don't know, communicate with spirits, maybe closing these doors was the best call. I don't think we welcomed in any good spirits. I don't think any spirits are clocking in for work, you know what I mean? And now it's closed, so I'm like, it didn't work. Whatever we tried, didn't work. Number two, ghost boots. These boots are made for haunting, and that's just what they'll do. Yeah, I put a pair of boots on this list. That's where we're at now. This photo of a young girl may look like a classic family trip, but upon closer inspection, it seems like somebody or something is standing behind her. Now, of course, her father said that nobody was behind her at the time that it was taken, and I agree. That, and like, honestly, and I believe him. Honestly, that would be pretty weird if he was like, hey, can you stand right here? Yeah, are you behind my daughter? Don't move, but you stand right here in this open field. Thanks. ka -ching. I don't believe it, I don't buy it, it's weird. This shot was taken at Zushi Zenigawa, Japan, and you can see boots and what looks like clothing sticking out from behind the child's elbow. The kid's father said, I took a few photos and when I was looking through them at night, I noticed the boots behind her. I took several photos in the same spot, but only one of them had boots. You always see that in movies, right? At night they're going through and they see like it's 2 a.m. It's never at a Walmart while it's being developed. They don't find these photos in a bright, busy area. It's always in a dark kitchen. Ugh, it's creepy. So he freaked out and then put it on Reddit and then now we're here. Full circle. And finally, coming in at number one, cave drawings. I know these aren't photos, but come on, there's nothing more eerie than humanity's origin, right? Let's do it. Let's go back. Let's turn the clocks back. And for archaeologists from around the world, this cave system in France doubles as the world's oldest art gallery. These Paleolithic paintings are haunting to look at. They were created from humans about 20,000 years ago, and it's now considered a heritage site. There's many of these caves around the world. So if you're thinking about sneaking down there in the last caught caves and taking a look yourself, well, you better think again. The cave was opened originally in 1948 but due to carbon dioxide levels from visitors, 
visitors, it was closed in 1963. Learning about our history is challenging, and when it's slowly fading away, that surely doesn't help. You just gotta hold your breath while you read? This is crazy. I'm currently reading a book called Supernatural by Graham Hancock, and in it, he tries to dig through history to find the origins of spirituality, and markings in caves like these ones from ages ago definitely help. They resemble these demon-looking creatures almost, and this is long before religion. These drawings were supposedly from hallucinations, but many believe it's one of the first accounts of a demon interacting with a human. It's just drawn on a cave wall. Peck Merle is a cave in France that also has these strange drawings, and some say they resemble aliens, others, of course, voting demons. What do you guys think? This is from 25,000 years ago. Write all your thoughts and concerns down in the comments below. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot today, we have the Rothschild Surrealist Ball. The Rothschild family is one of the wealthiest and most powerful families there has ever been, and you know with money comes power, and because of that, there have, for many years, been rumors swirling about just how powerful and influential they really are. That is why in 1972, when they threw what was called a Surrealist Ball, people began to speculate what kind of thing may have taken place at this elaborate soiree. These photos could potentially be very innocent, but there's just something about these elaborate masks coupled with the theories about what this family is really up to that just makes it feel very eerie. This party is one of the most legendary there has ever been, and whether or not they really are involved in shady dealings, that is still impressive. It's like the Project X of the rich and fancy. I'll take pools and kegs of beer over this weird mask party any day. Number nine. Winona Ryder. Back in December 2001, Winona Ryder was doing a little Christmas shopping at a Beverly Hills Saks Fifth Avenue, only she wasn't using her Beetlejuice paycheck at the counter, instead she stole thousands of dollars worth of goods. She had accessories, a handbag, clothes, her arms were literally full of good stuff. She was then sent to the slammer for a whole, you know, four hours, then of course she was released on a $20,000 bail. She was charged with felony grand theft, but she was also charged with possession of pharmaceutical drugs without a prescription. That is a no no in Beetlejuice land. She had antidepressants on her while she was being arrested. She wasn't intoxicated or anything. She was actually well mannered. Even Lieutenant Gary Gildman of the Beverly Hills Police Department said she was a, and I quote, true lady. That's how you, that's a true lady. That's what you gotta do. Just steal a bunch of sh and be in Beetlejuice. Security footage showed the actress cutting tags off in the store, and when she left, she was immediately detained. It's widely known at this point that Winona isn't a horrible person by any means. She was going through stuff at the time, but this photo, no matter the context, it just looks bad. Honestly, I think it's the floppy hat. She just looks like she's doing a diamond heist. I don't know. In our number eight spot today, we have John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy is known for a multitude of reasons, but discussions about his health often don't take place. This photo shows just an inch of the struggle Kennedy went through every day, as it is said he suffered from some sort of painful intestinal problems. Apparently things were so bad that for a while it was thought his illness might have been terminal. Aside from the intestinal issues, he also suffered from extreme back pain that stemmed from spinal problems he had as a child. Apparently these back problems were so bad that they almost kept him from service in World War II. After his election, although the world saw him as a young, handsome president, he really was struggling with his health behind the scenes, and it can definitely be seen in this photo. However, it is said that whenever anyone asked him how he was feeling, his only response was that he was in, quote, excellent shape. Number seven, Stalin Photoshop. Deep fakes are getting out of control. Modern technology is really making it hard to tell what's real and what's not. I thought I knew what was up. Apparently my eyes fool me more often than not. Photoshop is also an essential now for pretty much any project, including your selfie. You gotta touch it up a little bit, get rid of those blemishes. But well, back in 1939, a photo of Stalin was published and he looks great. Some would say too good. Well, he retouched a 1924 photo photo and then used that as his headshot when he became a leader later on. Even if you get a photo with Stalin, you might not be there in the future. Yeah, there's a chance you would be digitally removed even back in the day. Like Nikolai Yetov, for example. The leader of the NKVD was in a photo with Stalin, he was, but around 1937, Nikolai was responsible for orders that had over 1 million people arrested. And to make matters worse, half of them were executed for crimes against the state. So it wasn't ideal to be in a photo with Nikolai. He was denounced, imprisoned, and he died later on in 1940, so Stalin had him erased and replaced digitally. Look at that. If you look close, you can actually see Lizard getting punched by an invisible Spider-Man in the background. Yeah, we caught it. The man was ahead of his time. Even today, we're replacing actors in movies with different actors, and you wouldn't even know. In our number six spot today, we have the secret Pacific Ocean Air Base. Also known as the Johnson Atoll, this secret air base is located right smack dab in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Said to be the location of numerous nuclear tests, the United States government was sure to release little to no details surrounding this location or what exactly goes 
on there. How comforting. Something about nuclear and secret seems ominous. Aside from being a little secret base, this place is also the home to a thriving community of nesting seabirds, and since it's literally in the middle of the ocean, the marine life surrounding it is significantly diverse. This has all led to there being teams that do environmental monitoring and maintenance to protect the wildlife. Like how weird is it that this is the place they use to store and dispose of Agent Orange, but they're also like, we gotta protect the birds. I mean, I'm glad they're protecting the birds, I just think it's ironic. To get into this place, you either need to be a part of the United States Air Force or have a special use permit from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So random. At number 10, we have Look Out Below. The kid in this next photo is about to get a shower he never asked for. If there's anything that this picture has taught me, is that I am right in my quest to never have kids. Look at how gross this is. Oh, it looks thick too, like the stream of puke flowing out of that kid's mouth is a fresh brew of whatever he ate for breakfast and all of the midnight snacks he had. That kid is getting puke all over his head and he's gonna be picking chunks out of his hair. But this is why kids can be so gross. For the most part, they're pretty fun to hang around. They have so much energy and they keep you updated about what's going on in Fortnite and all those other things. But every now and again, you will get one that will puke on your head without remorse. If you feel like you're going to puke, you should probably leave and go to the bathroom. This picture can wait. But at the same time, I am so grateful that this kid has such poor puking etiquette because now we have this amazing photo on this list. I just feel bad for that kid who had to get puked on. This looks like this picture was taken at the start of the season and his jersey is already ruined. At number nine, we have be aware of your surroundings. If there's anything that football has taught me is that you always need to have your head on a swivel. If you let your guard down for even a moment, you might have the world come crashing down on top of you. Or you might end up doing an unexpected backsplash. Oh lord, she a coming. This picture is so perfect. Let's ignore the dude's tan nipples for a moment and look at that lady who's about to ruin her phone and everything on her person. If you look closely, you can see these small ripples that are coming off of her feet because they're just touching the water. That's how you know she has reached the point of no return. Or who knows, maybe this lady is the reincarnation of Jesus Christ and she's about to walk on water and everything will be fine. Probably not though. I love how this is the exact moment before anyone has noticed and she is too far gone for anyone to save her. The only thing that would make this picture better was if it was a video. I need to know how this plays out. At number eight we have wear a helmet. We all want to look cool. There's something deep in our souls that make us urge for human approval and that sometimes will cause us to make decisions that are perhaps fashion forward, but put your body at risk. Like what's going on in this picture right here. This guy is about to meet a world of hurt that he never knew was possible. And to be fair, it's not really his fault. I can't knock him for his ability to ride the bike. It looks more like it was shoddy craftsmanship rather than poor driving skills that led to this disaster. But this dude is about to get some road rash on his face and maybe lose a few of his teeth. The crazy thing is that all the dudes in the background have helmets. On. Why didn't you join them in their quest for cranial safety? At number seven, we have you're not licensed. Usually, if you do a photo shoot on a heavy piece of machinery, you make sure that said piece of machinery is turned off. But I guess this time they didn't really care and they underestimated the power of an ATV. I love how every face in this picture has a different expression of terror. First, you have the grandma who has her maternal instinct kick in and feels the call to save that young boy. Then you have the kid falling, uncontrolled fear, a quick reaction realization that he has no control over the situation and his fate is no longer decided by himself. Then you have the kid driving. His brain is trying to understand the power that he now possesses, and his heart knows that he will never tame it. Also, driving kid's face is so red it looks like it's gonna pop like a cherry tomato. At number six, we have hot rain. What does someone have to do to try and get a little sun without being disturbed? If you live in the northern parts of North America, then sunshine only comes around a few months a year, so you want to try and enjoy every last second that you can get of it. And then something like this happens. Oof, that girl is in for a rude awakening. The worst part is, is she doesn't see it coming at all. She's gonna have hot dog pee showered on her like she's in a super soaker fight. Even worse than that, it looks like she's sunbathing in a park. If she was on a beach and this happened, at least she could get up, run to the water, rinse herself off, and all the pee would be gone, and she would only be left with the emotional scarring that comes with the social embarrassment that will never leave her. But she doesn't even have a towel there. She's gonna have to get dressed, walk home in the sun, and have a bunch of people give her weird looks because she smells very strange. At number five, we have batter up. 
I've never been to an MLB game, but I thought they had nets to prevent this kind of thing from happening, but I guess not, and these ladies should not have been sitting in these seats because none of them are ready for what is about to happen. If you're going to sit in the hot seat, then you better be ready to catch those rogue balls because shutting your eyes is not gonna help the situation. All four of them have their eyes closed. They're like, ah, no, please don't kill us. It's gonna kill you, it doesn't care, it's a ball. Mind you, I have to say, if I was in that position, I would be doing the exact same thing. I'm not a ninja. I'd be sitting there with a black eye and a cold beer pressed against my eye socket. And number four, we have you didn't even make it to the wedding. You hope your wedding dress is going to look great on the day of your wedding, but then this happens, and you better hope that it is machine washable. Oh no, that is not gonna go away anytime soon. It's done, it's the biggest day of her life and it's over just like that. Might as well tell everyone that the wedding is canceled. I bet the cameraman got fired after that. Why didn't he warn them about the impending doom? The real disaster is gonna be the bride who has the unstoppable rage coursing through her veins. And number three we have, well, that's all this picture says. Just, well, I've never seen someone accept their fate better than this lady. Maybe the picture is photoshopped and that's why she seems so accepting of the situation. Maybe this is a camera trick to make the waves seem way closer than they actually are. But I like to believe that this is actually a massive wave about to crash down on this lady. I don't want her to get hurt, but I want her to lose her hat and her flip flops and have a family member bring up the story about how Sherry got tossed in a wave in the Bahamas at every family get together. Maybe just a little water up the nose too. And number two, we have bad friends. This is what happens when you hang out with bad people. They will do stuff like this at any chance they get. And I have to say, I am one of these bad people. I would have totally done the same thing in this situation. This poor guy's little Johnson is about to meet its end in the worst way possible, and he doesn't even see it coming at all. Worst of all, the dog doesn't know that he's doing anything wrong. He's just trying to solve the mystery of the red dot. And for our number one spot, we have it sucks to be a duck. As humans, we have a pretty sweet spot on the food chain. We don't have to worry about creatures jumping out and trying to eat us at any moment. We've managed to cage ourselves in some pretty nice cities that protect us from all the horrors of the world. And I cannot say the same for this duck. Holy moly, this guy's about to get chomped on by 300 teeth. That is the last thing this feathered friend is ever gonna see, a cage of dentistry tearing him apart. At least it will be a quick death. That bird is gonna be ripped in half before he's able to process what is happening. Not the preferred way to die, but at least a decent one. I think that's a warrior's death or something. It's at least a bird's death. Kicking off the list at number 10, Victorian memorials. I'm a sucker for dark history, and when it comes to the Victorian era, there is nothing more grim, honestly. Deadly dresses, the great stink, rats everywhere, it's a dangerous time. The life expectancy was of course a lot shorter than it is today. So you really had to hold on to those you loved, right? But this is a time where we don't have iPhones, we don't have Facebook just randomly showing you memories. Remember this? Like no, stop. So how do you remember a loved one after they've passed away? Well, Victorian morning jewelry, that's how. In the 1750s, it would be normal to carry with you a gold locket with hair from your past lover. It's, yeah, a little locket of hair. How cool is that? Creepy? A little bit creepy. It was often braided or neatly folded. It wasn't just a ball of hair stuffed in a locket. Although it wasn't not that either, right? It was pretty gross. During Queen Victoria's reign, she would often wear mourning jewelry. She made the locket of hair cool, dare I say. She made it popular. After the death of Albert, she went into a horrible depression. She wore mourning clothes for decades and decades afterwards. That's why you see the Victorian era and everyone's wearing black. Everyone looks all grim. It's because they just followed suit. They just wore what the queen was wearing. Bracelets, necklaces, rings. The enamel of the rings also depends on the type of death that came prior or the type of mourning that you're doing. White enamel represented death of an unmarried woman. Pearls represented tears. Turquoise meant that you were thinking of them on that day. And eventually pendants with hair became a next step. I'm a fan of mourning jewelry. I like that idea. I wish I knew this sooner. I wish I knew this 10 years ago. I'd be like, oh, my eyebrow piercing? Yeah, it's to mourn my mother. That's why I got it. Sad and rad. Boink. There you go. Number nine, Detroit Ice Fountain. Located on Washington Boulevard, the Detroit Ice Fountain was 
quite the hazard. A spectacle, but a hazard nonetheless. Back in the early 1900s, a fountain was the talk of the town during colder months. Believe it or not, it's how bored people were, I guess. The water jets would run all year long, so in turn, this fountain would freeze and pile up, and then freeze and pile up again and again. Eventually, this thing reached up to 60 feet tall, made of pure ice, right on Washington Boulevard. This was so dangerous, yeah, shifting ice, dangling 60 feet above your head on the way to work. Literally tons of ice cracking above your head. The tradition has now moved to Belle Island, thankfully, so now you can safely observe said ice trees. Just, you know, maybe not in the middle of the street anymore. Number eight, adhesive bras. Back in 1949, Life Magazine released an article that caught everybody's attention, obviously. May 16th, 1948, the article read, for 5,000 years, clothes have been draped, tied, buttoned, pinned, and buckled on the human form. This year, for the first time in history, they will be glued on. Bam. How? How did they do it? They changed the game. Could this be? We're gluing on shoes and pants now? Let's do it. Inventor Charles L. Langs changed the game, or so we thought, in 1949. He made bra cups that would stick onto you with adhesive. Just a, ring of, just a ring of glue. There you go. This special glue, this adhesive, was promised to leave behind no residue, and it was also supposed to be painless. Yet at the same time, it was supposed to stay glued on, even if you were to jump into a pool from 10 feet high. How? What's, that's, that was the sell, no way. Well, Langs ended up selling the company to Textron because it didn't work, the product ultimately failed, because the adhesive needed to be applied every single time you wore said cups. Nobody wants to do that. We're not putting on toothpaste on our bras every morning and sticking them on. And again, they barely even worked, so yeah. None of these, thank you, I'm good. Glue on pants, that'd be sick. Till then, we're not trying that. Number seven, German mascots. German history is of course dark. So dark that YouTube wouldn't even allow us to say certain words about certain people from that time. But we do our best. We like to rhyme, that's how we trick them. For today's list, I thought we'd take a look at Germany's fad of taking photos with polar bear mascots. Yeah, apparently that was a thing. Here in Toronto, we like to pose up next to the raptor or Jay, the blue Jay, it's always fun. Dap them up, it's always a good time. These photos are part of the teddy bear collection. They span from the First World War to the early 70s. The German bear mascot remained throughout history, but the company surrounding the polar bear mascot, of course, changed drastically throughout the years. And it's really grim to look at. You see photos of a smiling mascot next to Yahtzee soldiers. And then the next page, you see the same German mascot, but 40 years ago, you know what I mean? It's odd, you're like, ugh. It's like seeing the Blue Jay guy back in the 1800s. You're like, what were you doing? Many believe this craze began after two polar bears arrived at the Berlin Zoo back in the 1920s. That's where it all kicked off. Because of course, it was a major tourist attraction. But these suits, we can't forget, were first worn, of course, by natives for ritual practices, specifically the native people of Pacific Northwest. Romania as well, dancers would wear real bear skins as part of a pre-Christian tradition. It was meant to drive away the forces of evil or just pose up next to Yahtzee soldiers. That's where we're at recently. Number six, reindeer games. June 1941, the Germans were attacking the Soviet Union and it was one of the biggest attacks, of course, in history. Britain and US had to send weapons, supplies, anything really just to keep them afloat, just to keep them in the fight. Now they sent these supplies through the Arctic Circle, that was the only route, but of course it was littered with U-boats. Thankfully, the British HMS Trident was there to watch the waters and in turn the Soviets were able to fight on. So as a gift, as a thank you, the Soviets sent the captain of the Trident, the World War II submarine, a live reindeer. Yep, for the submarine, you know, just a reindeer for the sub. Doesn't make any sense, right? I agree. The British had to accept because it was ill-mannered if they didn't, so they had to keep a six foot tall, real life reindeer on a sub. Her name was Pollyanna. They brought her on board through a torpedo tube. Imagine being in battle and then having to deal with this after. You're like, guy. We don't need this right now, please. She was a crew member for six weeks. Six weeks, imagine the smell. And she slept better than most. She shared a room in the captain's quarters. Horrible. Finally, the Trident returned home to Britain and our leading lady was donated immediately to the Regent Park Zoo. Yeah, they didn't keep her on the sub. Weird, right? Number five, Alfred Hitchcock and the MGM Lion. We're on part three now, so things are gonna get a little more bizarre. I'll veer more into the weird, gladly. Like this photo, for example, from 1958, taken by Clarence Sinclair Bull. The photo appears to be, well, it doesn't appear to be, it's Alfred Hitchcock serving tea to Leo the Lion. The famous MGM Lion, that's him. That's the guy. I want an autograph right now. 
He loves suspense and tea. Who would have thought? North by Northwest was the only film Hitchcock did with MGM, and there's actually a rumor that he directed The Lion's Roar for the MGM intro. But that, of course, is nonsense because you can't direct a lion. Yeah, just a little more lion-like. Awesome, thanks, Leo. Let's take lunch. We're killing it. No way, this, that didn't happen. There have been seven MGM lions in total, but Leo was known to be the most friendly. He's still on the logo today. He's an OG, he's made it. But again, back in the 1950s, it's hard to say what it really was like on set. You know, like it's still a lion and it's the 50s. I don't think we have a lot of laws and stuff. It was probably a really rough time for Leo. Number four, the hobble skirt. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. Although maybe, they might, they might make a comeback, we'll see. The headline reads, the hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. What a pitch. Doesn't that sound like a bad time already? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything, honestly. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust whilst also shackling the legs. To keep it a little, you know, keep it classy. You know, what's, what's more classy than shuffling around? all day long and being late. Nothing, love the practicality on this one. Thanks, Paul. So despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Damn it, we're missing out. We'll get up next time. Guess I'll just stick with my jeans like a fool. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons. They could actually walk around. Imagine that, eh? What a weird, what a weird concept. Hobble skirts luckily didn't last, but every now and then I sent the comeback, you know? With the Kardashians, I'm like, eh, that's close. That's close to a hobble skirt. Locomotion is seriously impeded. What a sell. Number three, Gloria Steinem. Back in 1963, the Playboy Club in New York City was one of Hugh Hefner's greatest accomplishments at the time, of course. The club was the talk of the town until Gloria Steinem came along. See, Gloria was a feminist writer. She created Miss Magazine back in 1972, but her career began much earlier around the 60s. See, she got a job as one of these Playboy bunnies and worked at the club undercover secretly taking notes on how this key holders only establishment was actually operating, you know, behind the pages. The staff were these young women, the bunnies of course, they had to wear black bodysuits, the puffy white tails, the whole getup. And at age 28, Gloria worked undercover for three weeks. The piece she released after, appropriately titled A Bunny's Tale, got so much attention that it kickstarted her freelance career. It made her a feminist icon to this day. This photo of Gloria undercover shows you the comfortable work outfits that she had to endure. That's horrible, it's all dark too. You can't even see what's going on. People are smoking inside. It's like Peaky Blinders, it's horrible. I don't think she had non-slips on, you know what I mean? In a collection of her writings, Gloria reflects on the undercover piece, saying how it has now outlived all the Playboy clubs, both here and abroad. That was before Hefner passed away in 2017. I'm sure she didn't mean outlive literally by this statement, but she also did, you know? Number two, Stalin Photoshop. Deep fakes are getting out of control. It's insane. Modern technology is really making it hard to tell what's real and what's not. I'm falling for a lot of things online lately. I'm starting to feel like an old man, I'm not gonna lie. Photoshop is also an essential now for any project. It's probably why you click this video. You saw the thumb and you're like, mm, what's this? Photoshop. Back in 1939, a photo of Stalin was published and he looks great. Guy looks amazing, some would say too good. He was touching up photos as far back as 1939 to make himself look more powerful, more healthy. But even if you got a photo with him, there's a chance you would be digitally removed later on. Like Nikolai Yetsov. Yeah, the leader of the NKVD, he was in a photo with Stalin, but around 1937, Nikolai was responsible for orders that had over 1 million people arrested. And to make matters worse, half of them were executed for crimes against the state. So it wasn't ideal, of course, to be in a photo with Nikolai. He was denounced, imprisoned, and died in 1940, so Stalin had him erased and replaced digitally in that photo. This man was ahead of his time. Even today, we're replacing actors in movies with different actors and you wouldn't even know it. And finally, number one, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. Ah, uh, yes, we all remember hearing about this at one point, even if you wanted to or not. Bill Clinton talking about not having relations with that woman. Yeah, back when we had to download music on LimeWire, this would just pop up out of nowhere and blow your eardrums out. This was a huge scandal. This was that scandal. It was 1998, Clinton White House intern Monica Lewinsky was 22 years old and they had a relation from 1995 to 1997. Lewinsky said she hooked up with Bill nine different times at the White House. Of course, you have to count. You're at the White House, obviously, you're keeping note. And apparently, according to her schedule, Hillary Clinton was also at the White House for at least seven of those days. Hey, big yikes. Whenever I see this photo, I wish I was alive to see this unfold in real time. 
I mean, I was alive, but I was, you know, number 10. Go Pills. Introducing Go Pills, the pill that keeps you up for 40 hours straight. What could possibly go wrong? When the government tried creating these new pills, the right idea was in mind. Or so we think. Overnight workers, military, maybe you need to cram three days of studying in in one night. You name it. The US Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, was supposed to have your back. What happened? The Air Force has around 100 fatal crashes on record because of fatigued pilots. So US military was actively trying to create a solution for these physically demanding jobs. The closest that we have now to these go pills are something called modafinil, which is a narcotic approved by the Air Force to combat said fatigue, but it's not public yet. Of course, obviously. Do you think these government go pills will ever make it to the public? I mean, I think coffee makes people crazy enough in the mornings. I'm all set personally. I'm on like coffee number four. I'm jazzed up right now. Number nine, the heart attack gun. Sounds like a pretty calm weapon right there. The CIA had this weapon and it was more of a dart gun than anything, but you know, heart attack gun sounds pretty on the nose for this list. It shot a frozen dart filled with a specific toxin that, you guessed it, gave you a heart attack. Pretty James Bond, right? It was frozen so that the dart would ideally melt away after it's done its damage. You know, destroying all the evidence, right? It's like some icicle killer stuff right there. That's some, that's some next level, there we go. Took me 17 <laughs> seconds to remember what an icicle was called. I was like, what are those long drippy frozen things? The uh, icicles. The CIA was really into poisons during the Cold War and apparently darts. Match made in heaven. The public caught wind of all this thanks to Senator Frank Church, and when Congress decided to look into where these tax dollars were going, they found a plethora of illegal methods used by not only the CIA, but also the NSA and the FBI and the IRS. A lot of letters coming in, a lot of, a lot of sketchy letters. Frozen darts, that's insane. That's a confusing way to go out. You'd have no idea what happened. You'd be like, ugh, burr, ow. Like, it'd be that fast, that's crazy. Number eight. Project Iceworm. Ooh, speaking of cold, here we go. Back in the 1960s, under the Greenland ice sheet, the US Army started to build a mobile nuclear missile launch site, okay? It was codenamed Project Iceworm. It's a pretty fun name because it's cold and underground. We get it, right? Nice. The idea was that they would build the station close enough so that they could hit targets within the Soviet Union, all secretly, right? That was the whole idea. This project was called Project Iceworm, but there was another project called Camp Century that had to be done first. This is the top secret, sketchy stuff. Can't just hit the road with a few shovels, you gotta make sure it's livable first. Camp Century was a network of underground tunnels and places for workers to hang out, like a kitchen, a hall, supply rooms, communication center, all stuff like that. It was a supply camp. You know, whatever you imagine, it was that. There was also a nuclear power plant. That's the most important part to keep everything active, right? This was kept from the Danish government for seven years. A secret nuclear power plant for seven years. Yeah, we don't like those. But in 1966, the project was canceled because of shifting ice. Or at least that's what they say. No, it's definitely shifting ice. The whole place is melted by now. Number seven, leaked voters. Back in December 2015, personal information from 191 million voters was leaked to the public online. It happened very fast. This feels like yesterday. I remember this happening online. I was actually quite worried about it. Researcher Chris Vickery found this data while conducting a security investigation. See, Forbes had described Vickery as, well, dare I say, a good hacker, for lack of a better word. They're called white hat hackers. They find weak spots in security without sabotaging or exploiting them. You know, they're not villains. They're just like, oh, check this file, gotcha. They're nice, that's key, we need that. That's the difference. 79% of those eligible to vote were the victims in this leak. All their names, addresses, birth date, phone numbers, emails, even photos, you name it. Things you don't want people knowing, let alone third parties online. It's now out there. We're still unsure who was behind this entire leak, so that's comforting to go to sleep to, knowing. CSO Online and databreaches.net suggest that the information more than likely came from a software provider called Nation Builder. But CEO Jim Gilliam announced that that was not the case and they did not create the database. He said, nope, false. Although he conceded that it is still possible that some of the information that it contains may have come from data that they make available for free to campaigns. So a third party took what they could and really ran with it. It wasn't them, it was just their weak security. Nice, we love that. Just my photo, just in someone's Google Doc. I'm like, awesome. I don't want anything out there. I don't want my Google search history out there. That sounds suspicious. Number six, the Space Cube. In honor of Jordan Peele's new space movie coming out called Nope, we have to include some alien cover-ups in this government list. Not too long ago, this spinning cube-looking drone hopefully drone, was spotted over Missouri, and then only a couple hours later, it was seen again 700 miles away. That's a pretty far distance, that's a fast travel time. 
What's your secret? 44 year old Matthew Jandeka was minding his own business, hanging out on the porch when this caught his attention. It was a sunny day, so the light reflected off the cube and it caught his eye. But then a day later, another guy, 30 year old Justin Johnson, he saw the same exact thing in the sky. He saw it while he was driving home. The light and the reflection, same thing, caught his eye. At first, I thought maybe it was a balloon, but the movements were odd, he said. Well, it sounds like whatever this thing is, military aircraft, drone, whatever the case, it's pretty fast. Maybe they're filming Top Gun 3, who knows? No spoilers. Number five, Surtsey Island. Some islands are forbidden, like Heard Island. They're home to animals and wildlife that the government refuses to let humans be part of, which is sketchy in its own way. A lot of Jurassic Park vibes over there. But when it comes to Surtsey Island near Iceland, again, always Iceland, hiding secret government projects, well, Surtsey Island is a brand new island. We love it. Literally, this island formed from a volcanic eruption back in 1963, so scientists are using this fresh face of Earth to study what it looks like to not have humans in the picture for a change. Yeah, we have have seed vaults, a forbidden island, these projects make people uneasy. Hence why the government tries to keep them low key. That is until I come out and then loudly announce it and then tell you to hit that like button. Awesome. Number four, WikiLeaks Warlog. Companies have to live somewhere, right? We're a film studio in Toronto, we're a place we're not just a bunker, right? We're like an establishment, there's windows, we have a fridge, lots of coffee, we're okay. But where do places like WikiLeaks work? It's probably a sketchy establishment. It's probably nothing like Google, you know what I'm saying? Not a lot of beanbag chairs going on at WikiLeaks. Probably just one chair that everyone shares. Just one guy, it's literally just one guy. Today, it's a facility owned by Swedish internet provider Banhof. This is where they keep servers for WikiLeaks. Julian Assange was the front runner for this whole operation, so literally, like I said, it was one guy. His hard drive is stored in in this bunker behind a two foot steel door accompanied by numerous backup generators. So you're not getting in, pal. In October 2010, WikiLeaks actually published Army field reports from 2004. It's now one of the biggest leaks in US history. This report confirmed that there were over 66,000 civilian deaths in the Iraqi war logs out of the 109,000 in total. This leak also suggested that some American troops were classifying civilians as enemies in their statistics. Yeah, which is not great. That's, that's a borderline that's a big leak. These numbers were from 2004 to 2009 alone. Yeah, it's hard stuff. Number three, military weapons. Getting into the alien stuff, here we go. Psychoelectronic weapons. Yeah, apparently we're in a DC comic now. We have ice darts, ice rays, what's going on here? The first time Curtis Waltman heard of these military psychoelectronic weapons was when he received documents via Yahoo. Of all the places to get documents, you're like, oh. This is 10 years old. Originally, he had filed the Freedom of Information Act request to Washington State Fusion Center. He was trying to find out more on the clashes between Antifa and the far right. But instead, he got a response and it was all about experimental weapons. He's like, this is not what I asked for. What is this? Open. The guy gets a zip file back in return and it's called EM Effects on Human Body. Uh, how do you not open that, right? And that's exactly what he did. He opened this file because, of course, and in it he saw diagrams on these weapons and the effects that they have on people. Muscle quaking, body pain, just shivering, just your body shuts down, it's horrible. One of the effects allowed users to control their dreams, so it's not all bad, it's just kind of not right, unethical. This was clearly set by a mistake. Nobody should ever know about any of these weapons, these super dream weapons. I don't even know what's going on there. The only emails I get are from student loans. Those ones are not a mistake. Those ones I, I will keep deleting. Number two, inner armor. Not to be confused with your inner ninja. It's also pretty mighty. We've all wanted to be a superhero at some point. Okay, I'm always late. I would love super speed any day, that'd be great. Well, DARPA's inner armor project almost made a dream come true. It was the Pentagon's way of creating super soldiers. Yeah, like Iron Man, they were literally working on this. Scientists use animals as a reference for these new abilities, literally like from a Marvel movie. They're studying the DNA of the stellar sea lion because it can reduce blood flow away from organs if need be, in order to reduce oxygen demand. So now we're studying that to try and make I don't know, people like Atlanteans? Where are we going here? That would be sweet, just Aquaman with a tactical vest and a spear. Okay, that's, sure. Dr. Michael Callahan, who was in charge of running the operation, he says the goal was to make soldiers kill-proof against disease, chemical weapons, radioactive weapons, harsh weather conditions, you name it, all that good stuff. Pretty much invincible. Now, this was back in 2007, and of course, in 2014, Barack Obama announced that the United States was still building Iron Man, so maybe they're close. Maybe they haven't done it yet, who knows. Honestly, I'm seeing videos every day of like these guys on hoverboards whipping down New York. We're so close to the Green Goblin in real life. We're 
or like the water pier guy, he like uses the water to float. That's like two villains. It's two villains right there in real life. And finally, number one, MK Ultra. We have to finish with a mind control project. It's the only way, of course. MK Ultra was a secret CIA project that lasted from 1953 to 1973. It's a long time. They ran hundreds of experiments to US citizens. They gave them illicit substances and other narcotics, just horrible stuff, all in attempts to crack mind control, or as they call it, information gathering. Mind control, it's definitely mind control. In the 50s and 60s, around the Cold War, the United States believed that the Soviets, Chinese, and or North Korean agents were all using mind control in the war. I mean, how else could you explain brainwashed prisoners of war in Korea, right? Nothing to do with what they're doing to them. Sure. The program had subjects take LSD, hallucinogens, paralytics, electric shock therapy, horrible stuff, just being put through the absolute worst, all in places like universities or hospitals or even prisons, right? You have no idea this stuff's happening. The happenings of these projects weren't fully known to the public until years after it ended. But the agency destroyed most MK documents back in 1973 when the whistle was blown. So we think we know, but in reality, we only know little to what happened during MK Ultra. Starting off this countdown, we had the helicopter crash. In 2019, 32-year-old Benno Anthony Penna and his wife, Megan Michelle Hawk Penna, went out for a helicopter ride in Utah. Their plan was to fly to South Valley Region Airport in West Jordan. Their ETA was 2 p.m. When the pair failed to arrive, helicopters were sent out looking for them. Shortly before 6.30 p.m. that day, their helicopter was found. Sadly, they had crashed. This photo was posted just a few minutes before the deadly crash. Look how happy the pair look. Little did they know what was soon to happen. Now, authorities don't know for sure what happened, but it was reported that there was some heavy weather in the area that day. So maybe that's what played a role in the crash. It's a very tragic story. In our ninth spot, we have the drowning. On November 11, 2017, fans of the Filipino TV star and dancer Franco Hernandez were heartbroken when they heard the news of his passing. On that day, he was out with his girlfriend and some friends on a small boat. This photo was taken that day just before a wave hit their boat, knocking everyone overboard into the water. Sadly, Franco drowned. The people operating the boat did manage to pull him and his girlfriend back onto the boat, but by that time, he was already unconscious. He was immediately brought to a clinic, but was declared dead on arrival. This is so sad because everyone was out enjoying their day, having fun. Little did they know what was going to happen. Moving on to number eight, we have the day the music died. February 3rd, 1959 is also referred to as the day the music died. Because on that day, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and JP Richardson died in a plane crash. The three had been on tour together. That day, they boarded the plane and were headed out to the next stop on their tour. But the three men and their pilot never made it. Now the thing is, the trio had been taking a tour bus for the first half of the tour, but they said it was unreliable and freezing cold. So being fed up, they decided to take a charter plane. Had they continued on with the tour bus, they would have made it there alive. This photo was taken of the three artists right before they hopped on the plane. It's the last photo of them. Apparently, the pilot was unaware of a weather advisory that had been issued before takeoff. A short while after liftoff, the plane ran into troubles and crashed. Apparently, the scene of the crash was very gruesome. The three artists had been thrown from the plane in the crash. The pilot was trapped inside of the cockpit. Coming in at number seven, we have the cliff jumping. Several years ago, naval air crewman Shannon Nunez decided to take a celebratory jump at a popular cliff jumping spot in Hawaii. She was celebrating her recent qualifications as a naval air crewman. Jumping off this cliff was quite common in the area, but it's also very dangerous. The cliff is roughly 80 feet high. She took this photo before her jump. Little did she know what was going to happen. When she jumped, she ended up landing sideways. She then started to panic and drowned. Her two friends that were with her tried to save her, but it was far too late. She was so excited for this jump. She was so proud of herself and her accomplishments. It's just sad that it had to end this way for her. Coming in at number six, we have the falling rock. This photo features a group of individuals who went out hiking. Little did they know what was going to happen a few moments later. Literally minutes after this photo was taken, a rock above fell and hit the man on the far right in the red shirt. It crushed him completely. He was dead upon impact. All his friends witnessed this happen to him and that must have been traumatizing. Like it was such a freak accident. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the Burning Man Festival. The Burning Man Arts and Music Festival is an annual festival that takes place in the Black Rock Desert of Nevada. Tens of thousands of people gather from all over the world for it. 
Its main attraction is this big effigy that is then lit on fire. Well, during the festival in 2017, a man named Aaron Joel Mitchell ran right into the burning structure. He was burnt alive. To this day, his family does not know why he did this. He was not depressed, nor was he having thoughts of taking his own life. On top of that, a toxicology report showed that he did not have any alcohol or drugs in his system. But Aaron decided to dodge security and then run straight into the flames. Firefighters tried to stop him, but they were unsuccessful. When they did retrieve his body, it was far too late. This is the last photo ever taken of him. It's the moment he took his own life by running straight into the flames. In our fourth spot today, we have the birthday murder. On December 17th, 2017, 21-year-old Ismael Gutierrez and his friends went out for dinner to celebrate his 21st birthday. This photo was taken at his birthday celebration. Gutierrez is the young man holding the bottle. Later that night at around 3 a.m., he had been shot along with a random female. The group had been at the wrong place at the wrong time. Gutierrez and the woman were both taken to the hospital, but sadly, he did not make it. And the fact that this happened on his birthday when he just wanted to have a good time makes it 10 times sadder. In our third spot, we have the cabin fire. A couple of years ago, Bethany and her friends decided to go to a cottage. They spent the day out on the lake and then had a nice barbecue dinner. This photo was taken of Bethany out enjoying her time at the cabin. Sadly, six hours after this photo was taken, Bethany lost her life. An ember from the grill sparked a fire on the cabin deck. Soon, the whole cabin went up in flames. All the friends were able to escape except for Bethany and a dog. This is why you hug your friends and family extra tight. It's sad, but you never know when their last day will be. In our second spot, we have Cameron Boyce. On July 6, 2019, Disney fans were shocked when they heard that the talented child actor Cameron Boyce had passed away in his sleep. He was taken from us way too soon. He was only 20 when he passed, and he had a bright future ahead of him. Now, Cameron passed away in his sleep due to a seizure which was brought on from an ongoing medical condition for which he was being treated for. Still, no one saw this coming. This photo was one of the last photos ever taken of Cameron. A beautiful photo of a beautiful soul. And in our number one spot today, we have the armed robbery. On September 21st, 2009, Angela Escobar and Alex Santiago were sleeping peacefully when an armed robber entered their home and shot them both dead. The robber proceeded to grab some personal belongings before fleeing the scene of the crime. This is the last photo of Angelina. What a beautiful and innocent soul, taken far too soon. Eventually though, the killer was caught. His name is Christopher Dobring. He was caught after taking a phone call in jail. On the recorded call, he admitted to shooting both Angelina and Alex, and then said, and I quote, I have no sympathy at all, I can do that again. That don't bother me. That just makes me sick to my stomach. Rest in peace, Angelita and Alex. Kicking off our list at number 10, late night dip. All right, it wouldn't be a Taylor McWaters list if we didn't mention aliens more than once. This video was leaked last year in May. The footage is actually from 2019. It was recorded in San Diego. The Pentagon has since confirmed its authenticity. The UAP, the unidentified aerial phenomenon here, we don't say UFOs anymore, that's so old school. The UAP is sphere shaped and it's flying at extremely high speeds. No exhaust, no propulsion system, just a metal ball whipping by San Diego. The sphere then vanished into the water afterwards. So in case you're wondering, no, it didn't land. No aliens got out. They're like, hey, how fast was I going? No, none of that. We have no answers. No answers yet. Number nine, Talos. Basically, I'm here to announce that we're building Iron Man. Tactical Assault Light Operator Suit, AKA Talos. It was once a project announced back in 2014. And like the former president said, this was supposed to be a modern day Iron Man suit of armor. Didn't end up being like that at all. It was supposed to change warfare entirely, but five years later, the project was scrapped. Or was it? It probably wasn't. Of course not. We're still working on Apple Watches. You're telling me they're gonna scrap this? Good joke. On one hand, obviously it's hard to do. We could barely launch Google Maps in one go, let alone a suit of armor. I imagine it's complicated. Sure. But with recent leaks, we can now take a peek at what could have been. See, ideally the suit would have given the user advanced tactical awareness alongside advanced military grade armor, which has an exoskeleton underneath that's wired to the helmet and the rest of the suit. You're, you're pretty much Iron Man. They figured out a few things while creating the suit, but overall this Iron Man armor wasn't close to being like what we're seeing on the big screen. We're, we're getting pretty close. We're getting alarmingly close, I'd say. Number eight, the cola well. 
If you dug a hole through the center of the Earth and jumped in, would you come out the other side? Of course not, this isn't a cartoon. But the Arctic Circle back in the 70s sure did look like a cartoon. The deepest hole on the planet. Yeah, let's gather resources and focus on this for a bit. Sure, during the Cold War, we love it. Scientists began working on the project in 1970. For many years, Russian scientists in winter coats were drilling a hole, just down as deep as they could get. What a great job that would be, eh? They got one third through the Baltic continental crust and they found rocks older than two billion years. It was quite the project, it was exciting. But eventually they hit this muddy lava and then in 1992, they stopped drilling. A huge concern here was that demons, demons, would be released from the earth. That's fair, that's more than fair, that's, a, that's an okay concern. We don't want those around, I get it. The previous title for the deepest hole belonged to the United States Bertha Rogers Hole, which reached 31,000 feet. The borehole still remains the deepest artificial point on earth. Now, it was odd for the United States to focus on beating the Russians to the deepest point on earth. We talk about the space race often, but we forget about this one the deep hole race. Stanley Yelnats would be so disappointed in us. We gotta talk about this more. Number seven, radar footage. Now normally when we see leaked footage, be it of UAPs or leaked documents, it's always the worst quality, right? It's always taken with like a Blackberry curve. It's hard to believe when military footage is horrible quality. Like we're trying, help, help us, help us help you. Like how can we see photos of black holes and not have a photo of a UAP yet, right? or do we? Well, Jeremy Corbell is here to help. He took to Twitter in May 2021, sharing footage of US Navy ships being swarmed by UAPs. This time we have radar footage from inside the ship. It came from the Combat Information Center in the USS Omaha. This 46 second clip was originally recorded on July 15th, 2019. And you could even hear a dude in the background yell about how fast the objects in the radar are moving. That's how you know it's authentic. It's a guy like, whoa, that's like, that's crazy. On that ship too, imagine what he's seen and he's surprised, I'm shook. Number six, the Amityville photo. Yeah, a little ghost stuff for us, why not? This photo was taken inside the Amityville house back in 1976. You see, it's the, the boy with the, the eyes. Nice, you got it, nice, good eye. At first, I thought this was from a horror movie. It looks fake almost, or set up, until you start to read the details. See, this photo was taken with automatic cameras equipped with infrared. So this ghost here probably wasn't expecting a selfie, right? Photographer Gene Campbell took this photo in 1976. Gene was working with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren on this case. Yeah, this was long before the movies. They were just really working on this case in real life. This is history, this is so scary. The photo was revealed three years after it was taken on the Merv Griffin show, and many believe this is the ghost of John DeFeo, one of the boys who lived there in 1974. Now you can't really do this anymore, right? You can't just whip out photos from an otherwise, you know, crime scene and be like, okay gang, is this a ghost? Let's take a look. No, there was obvious backlash for obvious reasons. It took three years for that photo to reach the public eye, and now all of a sudden everybody is talking about ghosts. Did this help? Probably not. Again, this was long before The Conjuring was ever released in theaters or anything like that. This would have been so random to see on TV. How frightening. Also, who believes in ghosts here? What's the ratio? Comment down below. I'm genuinely curious. I'm like 50-50 in the ghost game. Number five, quantum computer. This next one is pretty scary. Not a fan of this one. Computers are getting more and more advanced by the day. Andrew Garfield told everybody that that Spider-Man leak was fake and we're all like, Okay, we'll believe it. Yeah, we believed it. That's how good technology is. It's getting dangerous. Poor Andrew Garfield, but also poor us. We're for sure doomed any day now. But thanks to our man Snowden, Edward Snowden, it was reported in the Washington Post back in January 2nd, 2014, that the NSA is secretly working hard at creating their own computer. It's called the quantum computer and it cost around 80 million to build. It's a little more expensive than the new iPad. Just a touch. This computer is safely stored in a massive room size metal box, not intimidating at all, and it's part of a program called Penetrating Hard Targets. So it can break encryptions for just about anyone, anything, finance records, medical records, your old MSN, hopefully not, but maybe. What a nightmare that would be. The NSA is well on their way to breaking every form of public encryption, so we're doomed. This quantum computer can theoretically break through any RSA encryption as well, which for the average computer today, that takes years. The supercomputer can break through a lot faster. So yeah, you better clear that history now while you still can or else everyone's gonna see. Number four, more government leaks. Even allies of the United States weren't safe during Edwards' leak. Thanks to Snowden, at the end of October 2013, it was leaked that the United States was spying on Germany, France, and Spain, all at the same time. 
horrible. The NSA tapped into 35 phones spying on 35 different world leaders, one of which was German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who called out the NSA publicly immediately after finding out and said this act of snooping was just unacceptable between friends. That hits deep, eh? I thought we were friends, we're pulling that card out? Ooh, world leader or not, nobody was safe during these phone calls. It was also reported that the NSA was monitoring calls in Spain for the average folk. Yeah, they monitored around 60 million calls in one month. Imagine how boring that job would be. Just some dude listening like, Number three, North Sentinel Island. Heading over to India, this island is home of the Sentinelese tribe, one of the most forbidden islands on the planet. We don't talk about this island nearly enough. It's fascinating and it's also equally terrifying. It's located in the Bay of Bengal. North Sentinel Island is about 1,200 kilometers away from India and while most islands are shrinking or just disappearing, this one actually grew back in 2004. Yeah, the island lifted up a couple of meters during an earthquake so the west and south sides gained an extra kilometer. Yeah, more room for more inhabitants. Let's talk about them. The inhabitants on this floating cursed island are among the few uncontacted tribes left in the world. They've apparently been there for 50,000 years and there's no signs of agriculture or even fire, yet somehow this tribe has thrived for this long. And if we try and get close and you know talk to them or see what's up, they try and drive everybody away violently. In fact, back in 2006, two fishermen lost their lives because they got too close to the island without knowing who was on it. The Indian government also didn't roll up to the beach after and start interrogating locals. Instead, they made the island now officially forbidden to enter, so stay away. Number two, the mouse with an ear on its back. <laughs> what a transition, awesome, we love segues. Back in 1997, Stuart Little here became the test subject to determine if scientists could grow cartilage using chondrocytes, aka cells from a cow. And it worked, and now we're still talking about it today, obviously. It all started when Joseph Vicanti, pediatric surgeon, began designing human organs. This was during a shortage, he wasn't just, you know, bored and started to make ears, he was changing the medical game, and little did he know, he was actually about to change the science game as well. He constructed an ear, and then told his brother Chuck and his partner Bob to not bring up the fact that he attached said ear to a live mouse. He's like, please don't mention the mouse, please. How can you not? Here, check out this new ear I made. Hey, one sec, let me catch it. What? That's disgusting, what's going on here? What's this science lab you have? So Chuck spilled the beans. He didn't keep said information to himself. Can you blame him? No. But good thing he leaked the information because now we know cow cartilage can create cells. All because he spilled the beans, nice. Thanks Joseph, and also thanks to that mouse that totally didn't volunteer for this life. Can I Q-tip his back? I want to Q-tip his back. Let's clean that little ear for him, you know? I bet that would feel great. It's like a back scratch, but an but ear Q-tip at the same time. Imagine those mixed. Stuart Little, he's got it. And finally, number one, motorized roller skates. This last one, they've been working on for quite a long time. It's one of the craziest things I've ever seen working on this channel, so yeah, I had to end off this list with this. Motorized roller skates, what a dream. Is it happening, are we close? I sure hope not. This photo was taken at the Seneca Station in Hartford, Connecticut. Context aside, this is an odd one. It's a guy with a briefcase filling up at a gas station and he's wearing roller skates. Is this 2077? No, it's actually 1956. And that futuristic looking man right there, that's Mike Dreschler. He was working for a Detroit skate company and he was very dangerously close to gas powered roller skates. It sounds like something from a cartoon where he's like, oh, I'll get you, pew, and then he blasts off. This would never, don't try this. This is a horrible idea. They would have cost around $250, which today is around 2,400, and its max speed was 17 miles an hour. So you'd still be late and you'd still be buying gas. It was a lose-lose. Imagine this in the closing act of a Mission Impossible movie. How boring would that be? Now obviously the public wasn't supposed to see this. They feared that it would encourage folks to get creative on their own. So yeah, I'll reinforce that. Don't make rocket skates with gasoline. Thanks. Hit that thumbs up and don't make rocket skates. We love it. Don't eat Tide Pods or make your own jet boots. Starting off this countdown, we have the wedding. This story broke my heart. So this is a photo taken of Heather Mosher on her wedding day. She was battling a very deadly case of breast cancer. Sadly, she passed away 18 hours after getting married. So on December 23rd, 2016, Heather was diagnosed with breast cancer. That night, 
Her partner, David, proposed to her. He said he wouldn't let her go through this alone. Five days later, they learned her diagnosis was a triple negative. In September of 2017, the cancer had spread, so the two quickly made wedding arrangements. On December 22nd of 2017, the two were married. And just look at how happy Heather is. Again, 18 hours later, she lost her battle with cancer. Moving on to number nine, we have the falls. Just recently, a man named Roy George was out at Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. He was there with a friend. He was at the top of the cliff posing for photos when he accidentally slipped and fell over the cliff and into the falls. This was the last photo taken of him, moments before he fell. Apparently, he was taking photos in the spot known as the danger zone got too close to the edge and fell. Tourists heard his friend's screams and rushed to the scene, but by the time park officials got there, Roy was long gone. In our eighth spot, we have the brain aneurysm. This photo was taken on a woman's wedding. It shows all her friends heading to the venue. This is the last photo taken of the man on the left, the bride's best friend. Sometime during their wedding reception, the man had gotten into an Uber and gone home. He didn't say to anyone that he was feeling off or anything, but he suffered from a brain aneurysm, and a couple hours later, he was declared brain dead. The poor bride, on one of her happiest days, lost her best friend. She found out after the reception was over. She said that she spent her honeymoon mourning over his death. Like, that is so scary and tragic. Moving on, number seven, we have the vacation. This photo was taken by Dave Halley. It was of his wife and daughter aboard the plane headed off to their dream vacation. Sadly, they would never make it. Three hours after that photo was taken, a missile shot down the plane as it flew over eastern Ukraine. There were no survivors. This just breaks my heart. Like They woke up early, all excited for their vacation. Little did they know the horrors that were going to unfold. In our sixth spot, we have the Rhode Island Station nightclub fire. On the evening of February 20th, 2003, a fire broke out at a nightclub. More than 100 people were engulfed in the flames, including one of the guitarists playing that night. 230 people were injured. This photo was taken before the fire broke out. The fire was caused by one of the pyrotechnics, and you can see it in the background of this photo, along with some of the people that passed away that night. Now this fire spread very fast. Within seconds, the room was filled with smoke and people were panicking, trying to get out. However, this resulted in a human pileup at the exit. And that's why so many people lost their lives that night. Such a tragic accident. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the fatal photo. On July 2nd, 2013, combat photographer Hilda Clayton died while taking photos during a National Army fire training exercise. Unfortunately, a mortar tube accidentally exploded, killing Hilda and four National Army soldiers. Hilda managed to capture the blast that killed her. This photo hits deep. No one knew what was gonna happen. She literally captured the thing that killed her and the soldiers. It's so scary. Moving on to number four, we have The Last Dive. This mother shared the last photo that she took of her son on Reddit. He was swimming in their pool when she captured this photo of him. Five minutes after that photo was taken, he died due to shallow water blackout. Now, I think this topic needs to be talked about more because I'm a strong swimmer and I've never heard of this until now. Basically, shallow water blackout causes you to faint underwater. It can happen if you hyperventilate before diving or swimming or if you hold your breath for too long underwater. And it can happen to anyone, even advanced swimmers. Sadly, it happened to this poor kid. Moving on, number three, we have the dangerous selfie. Too many people in this series have lost their lives by trying to take selfies, including this next man. So back in 2016, a businessman named Jia Lijun went to a wildlife park alone, and he was super excited to be there. But while taking photos with a walrus, it ended up grabbing him and dragging him into the water. As a result, he drowned. So apparently, moments before this happened, Gia sent a bunch of selfies that he took with the walrus to his friends. Then, out of nowhere, while he had his back to the animal, it grabbed him and playfully dragged him into the water. So it wasn't like the walrus meant to kill him. A zookeeper rushed in to save Gia, but was sadly also grabbed and dragged underwater. They both died. In our second spot, we have SeaWorld. So the first time I heard about this case was through the Netflix documentary called Blackfish. Seriously, a super good documentary I highly recommend, but also pretty scarring. 
So on February 24th, 2010, an orga named Tillycum, Tilly for short, grabbed its SeaWorld trainer, Dawn Branshaw, by her ponytail and dragged her into the pool. She tried to escape his grip, but when she did, Tilly slammed into her and then grabbed her and shook her violently underwater by her arm. When medics did get to her, part of her arm was already off and in Tilly's mouth she sadly passed away. Now, before this happened, Dawn had a full show with Tilly. After the show, she fed him and poured some water on his face. She then sat close to him, talking to him and stroking him. They called this relationship session. A family videotaping managed to get Dawn's last few moments on film. And in our number one spot, we have the volcano eruption. On December 9th, 2019, Stephanie Browitt and her sister Crystal and her dad Paul were on White Island when the volcano erupted. This photo was taken six minutes before the eruption. The three of them were on a tour and it wasn't until they arrived on the island that they found out that the volcano alert level was at two, which is the highest level it could be before an eruption but they were on tour with their sea crews, so it wasn't like they could have just left the island. Well, as they were walking back to the boat, they saw ash coming out of the volcano. That's when their guide told them to run. Unfortunately, Crystal and Paul and 21 others died as a result of the eruption. Stephanie survived, but about 70% of her body were covered with third degree burns. She also lost parts of her fingers. All right, starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the reflecting pool. This is one of the creepiest or most chilling images ever taken. It depicts a young girl in a graveyard who is looking down at her reflection in a pond. Okay, maybe a little eerie, but not exactly chilling. What really makes this photo what it is, however, is that there are seemingly two different reflections looking back up at the little girl. No one knows who this girl is, where she is, or when this photo was taken, but it is estimated to have come from somewhere around the early 1900s. This photo was analyzed and it has been said that it is unaltered or edited. Who knows how this photo was possible? Maybe there was some sort of invisible entity standing beside her that we could only see the reflection of, like a reverse vampire or something. In our number 8 spot today we have Bikini Island. Bikini in the Marshall Islands was once inhabited by around 170 islanders until 1945 rolled around. The US president at the time, Harry Truman, ordered that the military continue to test nuclear weapons just in case they were needed in the future, since this was just shortly after the end of World War II. Unfortunately, Bikini was the place that was chosen to be the testing site, since all planes and ships traveled on routes that weren't close to the area. The residents of the island were asked to vacate, quote, for the good of mankind and to end all world wars, to which they of course obliged, under the impression that they would one day be able to move back. Test weapons were detonated on the reef itself, on the sea, in the air, and underwater, and this photo shows what was happening during just one of those tests, and it wasn't even the largest one. Although the former residents of Bikini were promised that they would one day be able to return home, the island still remains uninhabited because of the mass amounts of radiation that still exists there. In our number 8 spot today, we have this huge grasshopper. This photo is allegedly undoctored, or at least that's what people once believed, but as it turns out, this photo actually comes from a line of joke postcards, thank god. Apparently it was a hilarious hit back in the day to create postcards depicting a super super ungodly large kind of grasshopper. Like the kind that would make me line up first for a trip to Mars if I saw one hopping around here on Earth. Or should I say, leaping. Like for a second, just imagine. With how high regular tiny grasshoppers can jump, this thing would be jumping into the clouds for sure. Also like, what would it eat? No thank you to large bugs, especially ones that can jump. I'm just so glad that this one turned out to be fake. Even though it's fake, I wish this was still one that they withheld from the public. In our number 7 spot today, we have these prohibition barrels. The prohibition was the outlaw of the consumption of alcohol, which was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol by the US government from 1920 to 1933. This ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming alcohol, it was just done in sneakier ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead. This photo shows how big the black market industry for alcohol was, as it shows a massive massive stack of liquor barrels that were collected by the authorities in 1924 about to be set ablaze. The people look so tiny standing next to this insane amount of alcohol. While the prohibition is generally regarded as a failure, the biggest failure it caused was the unintended organized crime it put into life in America. In our number 6 spot today we have this neighborhood nuclear test. This photo shows a mother
mother and her young son looking out the window and witnessing a nuclear test explosion from the comfort of their own home in 1953. Like, what? Imagine seeing that from your window now in 2021. People would be going wild! Of course, any kind of nuclear test should be done as far away from where people live as possible. I know it's not like the test was being done in their front yard or anything, but still, I certainly wouldn't be comfortable with them testing a nuclear bomb anywhere near the place I live. This photo was of course taken before the effects of nuclear radiation from these kind of explosions were publicly understood. Actually, people have suggested that the public knowledge of these kinds of side effects were suppressed during this time in order to avoid controversy about them testing these kinds of weapons in your neighborhood. While that would of course be something insane to witness firsthand, thankfully the now widely known health risks associated with this sort of thing has caused this to not be a common occurrence. In our number 5 spot today we have the Boston Marathon. This photo comes to us from 1967 and it depicts the struggles that Catherine Switzer went through in order to be the first female to finish the Boston Marathon. This photo shows race organizers as well as other participants participants trying to stop her from running the marathon that she trained for and was more than capable of completing. She has written a book that explains in great detail all the things she went through that day and how the critiques and opinions about a woman running the race started even before she had registered to run. People in our history like Catherine are incredibly important as well as photos like these because they show when people were literally trying to drag her down, she just kept on running. In our number 4 spot today we have a traffic jam. On Sunday, September 3rd, 1967, Sweden and changed from driving on the left hand side of the road to driving on the right hand side of the road. Why? Well, I'm not exactly sure considering people downvoted the idea before it was implemented and it cost a ton of money to make the switch. Not to mention it's also super confusing for basically everyone and when we're talking about driving, the simpler the better. Traffic lights had to be reversed, road signs changed, intersections redesigned, lines on the roads repainted, buses modified, and bus stops moved. What happened when the change was implemented? Well, that's what this photo will show you. Absolute chaos. However, after the initial shock, things did start to get better as because drivers were much more cautious in the time following the switch, the number of traffic accidents actually dropped for a little while before inevitably rising again. Was the switch worth it? Well, no one is sure about that, but what are they gonna do? change it back. In our number 3 spot today we have the Three Jacksons. On August 21st, 1934, three fearless acrobats known as the Three Jacksons, Charlie Smith, Jewel Waddock, and Jimmy Kerrigan all performed a routine on the edge of the Empire State Building, which is when this photo was captured. It is said that these three toured as an acrobatic trio, and this stunt the photo captured was done at 1,245 feet. According to officials from the Empire State Building, it is said that this was the first time the stunt was attempted, and to this day, it has never been done again, which makes a lot of sense. While this photo is absolutely incredible and is such a testament not only to the trust they shared, but also their abilities as acrobats, I don't know who in their right mind would try to recreate this. We already have one, and I think we can just all be happy with that. In our number 2 spot today we have the man who fell from space. Vladimir Komarov was a cosmonaut, Soviet test pilot, and aerospace engineer. He was one of the most highly experienced and qualified people, which is exactly why he was chosen for some of the very first space missions. He became the first Soviet cosmonaut to fly into space twice. Unfortunately, however, on one of these missions, things went seriously awry. A parachute failure caused his capsule to crash into the ground after re-entry on the 24th of April in 1967. He literally fell from space, and regardless of if you know anything about space and re-entry, that would have been absolutely terrifying and awful. He of course didn't make it, but the entire process left his remains almost unrecognizable. This photo shows his colleagues looking onto his remains before he was laid to rest. The contributions of people like Vladimir have allowed us to go further into space and understand more than we ever could have imagined. In our number one spot today we have the gadget. This photo shows the first ever atomic bomb and it comes to us from 1945. Called the gadget, this bomb was an implosion plutonium device that was detonated in the Trinity test in 1945. This photo shows someone sitting next to it, so casually, like it's a PB&J sandwich and not this world changing device. The Trinity test was the very first time a nuclear weapon was detonated and the gadget was actually the same design as the bomb that was later detonated over Nagasaki, Japan on August 9th, 1945. There's such an eerie nature about this photo and the seemingly casual behavior of the man next to it. Did he know what this was about to unleash? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. 